Le'Veon Bell laughs at your rankings, your running back rankings, while we detail why the Jets wide receivers are more than fine heading into 2020. Sable Radio, episode 50, 51, I forget, but about eight or 10 with JetX. The other ones were with ESNY. We took a long hiatus. Episode, one of the new ones. Let's just say that. Um, JetsXFactor.com, uh, the YouTube page, JetsXFactor, What's New, Joe Blewett just published his part one Pierre Desir uh, video. Part two coming, the article is already on Jets X Factor, the website. So keep an eye on that. Uh, I'm going to have some Brian Poole, Greg Williams film coming. Uh, Nania also just published an article on Adam Gase tendencies, which is interesting. For those who don't like Adam Gase, check out this article. It is interesting to say the least. How well did the Jets offense perform at every down and distance in 2019? What's the takeaway? Well, part of it, if you think Adam Gase outthinks himself, part of what's in here may or may not back you up. You have to be a subscriber to check it out. Serious analytics from Nania, film from Blewett, and away we go. Today, For those, there's a lot of chatter. For those who think the Jets wide receivers are pathetic and they're no good, I honestly don't know what to tell you. This is football. When the offensive line is downright horrible, the wide receivers are the last conversation that anyone should be having. Time and time and time again, we have witnessed wide receivers take a leap or fall down based on the talent around them. Like running backs, but not to the same degree as a running back. They are dependent on the players around them. They are dependent on the quarterback. They are dependent on the offensive line. Mike Francesa, WFEN, uh, I think this was last week, earlier this week or last week, commented, and WFEN put it out, what help has the Jets given Sam Darnold? And I agree with that. He hasn't been given any help whatsoever. He's been thrust into one of the worst situations for a young quarterback that there is. It's a football sin above anything I could think of. But then he compares Darnold to Brady. Look at Brady. He's got Mike Evans and Chris Godwin and Tyler Johnson. He, I don't think he knows who Tyler Johnson is, but he just said Tampa receivers. You get the point. They're stacked. Gronkowski. They drafted Tristan Wirfs. Their old line's going to improve. Yeah, of course, Tampa's receivers are ridiculous. But even Godwin made a huge leap from year two to year three. Why? Arians. The overall level of the offense around him. The receivers, the Jets receivers, are de- completely dependent on what the offensive line does this year. Sam Darnold, Very dependent on what the offensive line does this year. Le'Veon Bell, totally dependent. So it always comes down to the offensive line. And when you look at the offensive line from a year ago, there's no two ways about it. They were the second worst unit in the league. Miami was worse. Via Football Outsiders, 3.80 adjusted line yards, which really tells the story uh, on the ground. Ranked 31st in the league. Year after year after year under the McCagnan era, this stat is horrible. And this stat is the best when determining how good an offensive line is. Interestingly, and this is an outlier, Kansas City, 28th um, or tied for 27th in adjusted line yards with 3.88. Also not good in the adjusted sack rate department at 8.6, won the Super Bowl. And that's because Patrick Mahomes is Patrick Mahomes. But when passing the uh, ball, adjusted sack rate, Jets doesn't get any better. Again, 31st. Only Miami is worse. 9.8 in the adjusted sack rate department. 9.8%. 
Look at the teams around him. Miami, who are their weapons? Devontae Parker had a solid year. Pittsburgh, who are the weapons? Juju, what did you do last year? Injuries, disappointment. Chicago, ranked 29th. Who are their weapons? David Montgomery, the rookie. What a, what a disappointment for anyone in fantasy who drafted that guy. And count me among the crew, because I drafted David Montgomery last year. Just horrible. KC, 28th. They are the outlier. Jacksonville, 27th. Bad team. This is adjusted line yards, folks. Um, DJ Shark, solid, nice young weapon. For sure. But Jacksonville's no powerhouse. Cincinnati, 26. Giants, 25. Atlanta, 24. The list goes on and on. It, it's de- completely dependent on the offensive line. And interestingly, think recent Jets history in this department. Brandon Marshall. 2015 season, the guy was a complete stud. McCagnan snagged him, got Jets fans all hyped with his front office ability. Uh, cheap trade from the Bears, 2015, shattered records, 1,502 yards through the air, 14 touchdowns on 109 receptions with Ryan Fitzpatrick the whole year. 2016, it's not like he was injured. Played 15 games, 788 yards, three touchdowns, 59 receptions. What happened? Did he forget how to play? Did he suddenly hit a wall at 32? It's possible he slowed down and slipped a little bit. No question, because two years later, he's out of the league. But with the Giants the following year, he only played five games. And in Seattle, his last year, he only played seven. Injuries got the better of him. In 2016, he played 15 games. What happened? Why the sudden decrease? DeBrickishaw Ferguson retired after the 2015 season. Teams' offenses don't recover from such a guy retiring, such a stable force on the offensive line, if you don't adequately replace him. Ryan Clady was brought in, and the domino effect took hold. Fitzpatrick couldn't do what he did the previous year. Brandon Marshall, forget about it. And yeah, they had a cupcake schedule in 2015. No question. But the, I, the fact that DeBrickishaw Ferguson retired that year tells you all you need to know. Receivers are dependent on what's around them. They're, they're dependent on the infrastructure. Jericho Cotri, on the team, 2004, 2005, doesn't do much, plays a little special teams, a little punt return. Suddenly, Eric Mangini comes in, Tannenbaum come in, they draft Mangold, they draft Brick. They are desperately weak at, at the wide receiver department and running back department. Remember, they had Kevin Barlow, Leon Washington, a rookie who no one knew, uh, Chris Baker at tight end, Laverdius Coles at receiver, and Jericho Cotri. Cotri, this young kid who wasn't drafted that much, you know, it's not like he was a, a sterling prospect everyone was clamoring for. He was slated as the number two weapon that year, and everyone couldn't believe it. What did he do? Pulls off a great career. Has a good season as the number two alongside Coles. Shocks the world, shocks everybody. Jets fans fall in love with him. It began with the drafting of Mangold and Brick in 2006 that year that allowed the receivers and the running backs to play over their talent level. If the offensive line and the infrastructure is set, the development ceilings of everyone around them is raised. That's how football works. It trickles from the inside out. So when worrying about this weaponry group, don't. And besides, when comparing this group to last year's, it's really not a contest. Last year with Robbie Anderson, Quincy Inunua, Jamison Crowder, you didn't really have the potential of any one go-to guy for Darnold. Robbie Anderson is not that number one prototypical go-to guy. He can't catch it in traffic. He can't go up and get it. 
He's not a sideline acrobat. He doesn't have those talents. Anunwa, great possession guy who's physical, who's fast, but he sat out more games than he played. I think it was exactly 50% heading into last year. Now it's well over. Couldn't count on him. Crowder, excellent slot guy. The depth really wasn't there. Josh Bellamy, Josh Bellamy's a special teamer. That's it. And he was playing in week one once Anunua went down against the Bills. I think he had two receptions in week one or either one reception on that slant and had finished with two the entire season. When you compare that thin, uh, very low ceiling group to this group, it's no contest. Denzel Mims, for as young as he is, he possesses the ability to catch it in traffic, to go up and get it at its high point, to toe tap on the sideline. His route running, he's, he, he's not going to come into the league blazing with you know, every bit of the route tree down. He's not going to be able to read coverages 100% of the way. But that's his only hurdle. And if he can figure that out quickly, he will be Darnold's number one target immediately. But it's about the in-between-the-ear stuff with Mims. And if he gets that down, he's the top weapon. He's the top weapon when you look at this year's group, last year's group, two years ago, all the way up until 2015 with Brandon Marshall. I, I, I don't know how you could be concerned. Bashard Perryman is the number two. Bashard Perryman is more talented than Robbie Anderson. Like we just detailed, Robbie cannot do certain things that allow the quarterback to feel safe when throwing the ball into tricky situations. See, the, the quarterback needs to be able to be bailed out at times. And he needs to, to take those shots in smart moments knowing his receiver can bail him out. Robbie Anderson doesn't bail out quarterbacks. He has to be open. It has to be a perfect, uh, a perfect ball and a perfect route in a perfect situation. That's not the case for Perryman. Perryman could battle for the ball. Perryman could do certain things. Where Robbie has him is the reliability factor. Robbie Anderson only missed two games his entire Jets career. Perryman has been injured a lot. So that's a concern. Crowder versus Crowder, obviously. The answer is Crowder. And then the depth is just so much more there, so much more prevalent than last year. Josh Doxson, uh, Braxton Berrios, who I love, who's the number two slot guy. If, if Crowder went down today, I'd feel completely comfortable with Berrios. He, he's one of the hardest workers on the team. Vincent Smith, uh, Lawrence Cager, George Campbell, and those two kids are the undrafted looking to uh, impress this summer. And then you got Chris Herndon. A year ago, they didn't have Chris Herndon. It's no contest between last year and this year. And on top of it, when trying to build the infrastructure of a team, the wide receivers come last. And Joe Douglas knows this, and that's why he attacked what he attacked this offseason. Is it fair to ask him to draft another receiver in the draft? Sure, possibly. But he knows what he has in Berrios and Vincent Smith. It was his move to claim Berrios early last year. I believe it was his move to grab Vincent Smith as well. Those are his guys. They have depth. Don't worry about the receivers. ESPN recently came out with a list of the top 10 quarterbacks. And it's not simply a list of one writer deciding to provide his opinion in blog style. It's a list coming from a lot of the executives, coaches, and staffs in the league. And I think they're going to release 11 different positions. No special teamers. Um, this one was written by Jeremy Fowler. Obviously, again, it's voted by NFL employees who are closest to the situation. And here's how it shook out. Patrick Mahomes is number one, of course. I mean, there's nothing else to say. Russell Wilson is number two. I think it's right on the money. Aaron Rodgers, number three. 
okay. I could nod my head. Deshaun Watson, number four. Yes, I'm a Watson fan. Drew Brees, number five. Lamar Jackson, number six. Tom Brady, number seven. Who is grandfathered in to that slot? Carson Wentz, number eight. He's injured too much for my liking. Dak Prescott, number nine. I do not like that. Matthew Stafford, number 10. And I think Matt Ryan finished 11th. Roethlisberger is right outside. Kyler Murray, Kirk Cousins, Jimmy Garoppolo, Derek Carr, Ryan Tannehill, Jared Goff, Sam Darnold, who got one vote for a top 10. Where was it? Who knows? Probably 8, 9, or 10, somewhere around there. And that's it. One, you can't argue with. Two, I don't think you can argue with Russell Wilson. Three, I'd probably still go with Aaron Rodgers. Four, Deshaun Watson's fine. Listen, Lamar Jackson, I'm a fan of Lamar Jackson. I still think he has to prove it one more year. It doesn't matter who you are. If you are dominating within a certain unique system that the league doesn't overwhelmingly deploy, which is Greg Roman's zone read, you have to prove it. You have to do it more than one year. It's as simple as that. Remember Greg Roman with Colin Kaepernick in 2012 set the league on fire with the zone read. This was after the Wildcat got introduced down in Miami the NFL suddenly realized, oh, if we start to run these offenses like college and put pressure on the edge, we could do a lot of damage. And that's what the Wildcat did. The zone read starts to come in. Robert Griffin III is having wild success in Washington, whose name is up for debate right now, but that's a different topic for another day. Colin Kaepernick in San Francisco, Super Bowl bound. Uh, a pass interference away from possibly winning it, and Tim Tebow in Denver. All three of them. Defenses catch up in the NFL, however. And once they caught up, the zone read started to fade away. And then Griffin and Kaepernick and Tebow started to fade away as well. Is it back for good? Greg Roman did it in 2012. Uh, he was in Buffalo for a little bit. He's, his, his offenses always rushed the ball well. But when he could mix in the quarterback it always catches fire but it also always flamed out will Lamar Jackson and that Baltimore Ravens offense flame out I think at number six for Lamar is fair you could have went number five and put him ahead of Breeze Uh, I like Breeze but Michael Thomas that offense that offensive line uh, might be the best in the league that offensive line is ridiculous and Peyton is an excellent play caller so Lamar Jackson at five is fine, but I would have Watson and Rodgers ahead of him for sure. He's got to do it one more year. Brady at seven, whatever. I, I honestly think Brady's not shot, but it's going to be an interesting year with him. I think Arians will do fine with adjusting his offense to what Brady likes to do. And I think they will be one of the better offenses in the league, somewhere in the top 10, but there won't be that same magic. Carson wins number eight. Talented for sure to be in the top 10. Talented enough. He's not available enough. He's injured all the time. Prescott, number nine, no chance. Prescott should not be in the top 10. And Stafford is at number 10. I'd probably put Matt Ryan in there over Prescott. I'd probably throw in Roethlisberger over Stafford. I'd probably go Roethlisberger, number nine, and then Ryan and Stafford battling it out for number 10. Kyler Murray right on the outside. Kirk Cousins, I'm not a fan, but he deserves to be in the top 15. Um, Jimmy Garoppolo, I'm not a fan. Not a fan. Jared Goff, no shot. How did Jared Goff get a vote? I don't know. Derek Carr, same thing. Ryan Tannehill, I don't know how he got one vote. And Sam Darnold, does he deserve a vote, which he got? No, he doesn't. But it just goes to show you how bad a situation he was thrown in to start his NFL career. I mean, you think about these guys, Jared Goff and Darnold. What if they flip-flop teams? What if Darnold's on the Rams and Goff's on the Jets? Is Goff already out of the league? Is Darnold a Super Bowl champion? Where these guys go makes all the world uh, of difference. 
it, it, it changes everything. It allows guys to have a career against being a bust. It's just the way it goes sometimes. Other than that, um, Jets signed LaMichael Perrine today. They've signed uh, four rookies now. Five remain, including Mekhi Becton. Mims is signed. P. Ryan is signed. I called him Perrine. I have that issue. It's P. Ryan, I believe. LaMichael P. Ryan. Uh, Mekhi Becton remains unsigned. Ashton Davis remains unsigned. James Morgan. And I forget the other two. Maybe Cameron Clark. Uh, but four of the nine drafted rooks are signed. Uh, P. Ryan coming today. And the NFL also uh, banished jersey swaps at the end of games, thanks to COVID-19. Uh, listen, it, it makes sense, I guess. But uh, it kind of doesn't at the same time because guys are going to be smashing into each other face mask to face mask all game for 60 minutes, three hours. And they can't embrace each other after the game. Forget jersey swaps. Jersey swaps is a new thing that some fans get incredibly way too mad at. What about the guys, you know, the field where they congregate on the field after the game when they see guys they played in college with? That's going to look much different. It's going to look very, very different. So that's the other news that came today. And lastly, Le'Veon Bell. He's laughing at, uh, we just discussed the quarterbacks, ESPN rankings. Here are the running backs. Saquon Barkley, one. Christian McCaffrey, two. Zeke, three. Kamara, four. Derrick Henry, five. Dalvin Cook, six. Chubb, seven. Mixon, eight. Josh Jacobs, nine. Le'Veon Bell, 10. And on Twitter, he quote tweets it with a, capitalized lol exclamation point crying emoji for those on youtube who could see it hey let it be fuel to the fire listen 3.2 yards per carry last year what are you gonna do Uh, i know he's a talented guy but he's getting up there in age i'm on record i didn't want the jets to sign him but it has nothing to do with Le'Veon himself Le'Veon was the perfect guy last year the perfect leader the perfect teammate did everything right The reason I didn't want him is because, unfortunately, and it sucks for the running back, but the running back just gets screwed in this league, and there's no two ways around it. The running back committee approach and the salary cap has destroyed the value of these guys. If anything, when renegotiating the next CBA, even though it's done, they gotta gotta make each position more unique. And how contracts work. For example, first round picks are on a four year deal with a 50 year team option. That's fine for a quarterback, for a receiver, for an offensive lineman, for guys who have long careers. A running back, it should be two years and an option. Their shelf life is so much shorter that it should be. Uh, unique. Now, here's the issue. If it's two years and an option or three years and an option, do running backs start slipping in the draft? That's the issue. Uh, I'm sure someone much smarter than me has thought it before, thought about this before. Uh, But do they start slipping in the draft? And then, you know, the Players Association doesn't want positions slipping in the draft because they have uh, one or two years less of control when drafting. So I don't know what you do. I don't know what you do to solve the problem. I think it would be a better situation if it was three years in the team option and the running back was allowed to hit free agency a year or two earlier compared to other positions. Uh, strong safety, maybe too, because strong safety doesn't have a long shelf life. Shout out Jamal Adams. I think Jamal would be different, but you get it. You know, banging guys, strong safety is very similar to running back in a lot of regards. The positions with shorter shelf lives, and that's why Jamal's screaming for money, the positions with shorter shelf lives deserve to be treated differently per the CBA, where their contracts are a little shorter um, compared to everyone else's. It, It should be a percentage of the average of the entire shelf life, 
not every position is treated the same and they go by round. But that's, a, again, that's a different story for another day. Bell, hey, LOL, doesn't like the 10th place ranking. Um, in a lot of ways, it's kind of favorable. Uh, Le'Veon, we know it's not your fault last year, what happened. But there's some respect there, putting you at number 10. Uh, either way, use it as fuel this year. You got LaMichael P. Ryan, the newly signed guy, and Frank Gore on your tail. And if you think Bell's going to be the workhorse, he, he was in Pittsburgh, think again. They're going to use a committee approach. Bell's still going to be the star of the three. But all three guys can do pretty much everything. They're all versatile. They can pass block. They can catch it out of the backfield. P. Ryan, I don't know if, how good he is in the pass protection game. I'll have to watch a little bit of Blewett's review again. Uh, but they're all similar, and Gase will use all three of them. Use it as fuel. Le'Veon, let's go. You're going to have to really, really put it forward this year. Um, and the way your contract is structured, this could be your final year with the Jets, as most people predict. Um, but JetsXFactor.com, check it out. Blew it. Has his new uh, review, Pierre Desir. Is he a number one cornerback? Can the Jets call him a number one quarterback? Cornerback. He fits the pro- profile. He's tall. He's six foot one. Uh, he fits what Greg Williams wants to do. Zone, physical corners who could play cloud, curl flat, who could play deep third, uh, just like uh, Bryce Hall and Bless Austin. So he'll fit what they like to do. As long as Jamal Adams stays too, because Jamal Adams is a big component to their I- new identity that features the middle of the defensive backfield. But could he, can he be a number one corner? That's what blew it breaks down. Uh, JetXShop.com. Check that out. Until next time, Sabo Radio.